Hey, good morning, Live Love Nation. It is great to be with you this morning. Suzanne and I are currently in northern Vermont, and you better believe that we have already toured the Ben & Jerry's ice cream factory. Oh, that is some good eating. Let me start with a little bit of trivia. Do you know what the number one most popular flavor of Ben & Jerry's ice cream is? Go ahead, take a wild stab. What's your guess? What's the most popular flavor? Ah, some of you got it. It is half-baked. And then the second most popular flavor? I mean, this took me by absolute surprise. I've never had it. I've never even had the desire to try it. You ready? What do you think it is? It is Cherry Garcia. You know, if you know me, if it's not chocolate, I'm not eating it. But it is some good eating at that Ben & Jerry's factory. You know, what's also funny is we're in the parking lot heading back to our car, and lo and behold, there are a couple of Our Savior Snowbirds right there in the parking lot. We were able to connect 1,500 miles away from home. I mean, God is good. So this morning, you know what? I need to start with a little bit of a confession. And research tells me that over 80% of us have done this before. I bet on the Mega Millions lottery. Remember back in July of 2022, the Mega Millions went to $1.28 billion. It seems like whenever the Mega Millions goes up over $500 million, I'll give it a shot. I'll throw 10 bucks at it. And then all of a sudden, my mind starts to run wild. I mean, maybe you do this too. We begin to dream of what we could do with so much money, what we could buy. And then we start to think, wow, I could do all of this good with my resources. And we think about the ministries that we could support and the people that we could help. If you were to simply tie that after the government takes its cut, that's probably somewhere around $60 million that you could support a ministry with. And it is fun to think of that, isn't it? But have you ever noticed that on a day-to-day -day kind of business, so often we just kind of hold our finances tight? We don't want to let it go. We're worried. We're hesitant. Well, we are in the midst of a sermon series entitled Unshakable, Navigating Life with Wisdom. Now, my friends, we have all been around long enough to have made some good decisions, to have developed some good habits, things that we are proud of. But the reverse is also true. We've been around long enough to have made some bad decisions, to have some serious regrets, to have developed some bad habits. And when we tell our stories, we all have those endings that are, that are like, I sure wish I would have, or I sure wish I wouldn't have. We all have those different endings. We've all learned over time that life is connected, that our decisions of today impact our tomorrow, that the decisions we made years ago impact our todays. We've learned that life is connected, that life is like that old puzzle, connect the dots. But it's not a simple puzzle. Life is an extreme connect the dots. And so often I hear people make comment like, I'm just holding on tight and going for the ride. Well, my friends, I just don't want you to simply hold on tight. I want you to live life and to live it to the full. I want you to live with a, serious, with a, a sense of satisfaction, with a sense of purpose. And one of the most important ways that we do that is to live generous. Now, I know I've got some of my English majors out there and you're saying, well, ah, Pastor B, it's live generously. Yeah, you're right. But see, I want to live generous. I want to contrast live generous with be generous. See, when we live generous, you're going to save more money. You'll give more money. You'll consume less and you will be less consumed. Overall, you're going to be happier. You're going to experience more fulfillment. You're going to experience more joy. In fact, Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so this morning, I'm going to call my shots. I'm going to press you. And I'm going to press you kind of hard to live generous. I want to challenge you to live generous. Because so often we confuse generous with random acts of giving. You know, live generous and be generous. Be generous, well, that's just kind of random acts of giving. And all of us, I mean, we all like to give. 
all of us give. But when we are simply be generous, those random acts of giving, it's just simply that. It's random. And so often, it's spontaneous. Spontaneous means it's a sudden inner impulse that we have. It's without premeditation. It's, there's this external stimulus that takes place, normally emotional, that gives us the impulse to spontaneously give. We, we're, so we're spontaneous, we're sporadic, meaning we're irregular, we're scattered, we're isolated in our giving, and we're sparing. When we simply be generous, Oftentimes, it's regulated by our immediate cash flow. We open up our wallet or we think of our bank account and we say, well, I would love to help, but I can't give right now. And how often we can rationalize it and justify it in our minds. You know, I think it's interesting. In in, uh, Luke chapter 21, Jesus says that generosity is not the amount. Remember the story of the widow's might where Jesus was standing in the temple courts And and this poor woman went up and she basically gave all that she had. And Jesus said that woman gave more than all of the wealthy people standing there. They all gave out of their surplus, but she gave out of everything she had. In our culture, we can confuse amounts with generosity. But Jesus said, no, 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 it's not the amount, it's the percentage. So see, this morning, I want to challenge you to live generous, to live generously. Now, I don't know about you, but over the last several weeks, I have been just consumed with breaking news. I mean, there is so much breaking news out there, 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then you go to social media and you're just bombarded with more and more news. These important things that we have to know. And so often, it's like, it's just too much. It can become so discouraging that it can simply wreck your day. Over the last couple of weeks, we, we've seen stories about the natural disasters. Hurricane Ian. And I don't know if you're like me, but man, oh man, I feel so stretched. I mean, I was praying, Suzanne and I, we were praying earnestly for our family and our friends. The people that we love right there in St. Petersburg. And when the, the storm went south, Oh man, what a sigh of relief. But yet our heart breaks for everyone who is struggling, everyone who is hurting so bad right now. And so often when we are with this news and we have all of this negativity coming our way, we're like these deers in the headlights. We become paralyzed. We don't know what to do. And then you watch the news and there's so much violence and disagreement and distrust. There's hunger and homelessness. There is human trafficking. It can just become so overwhelming. I don't know if you're like me, but I just want to be able to shut it off. I just wish I could just ignore it, that I could turn a blind eye and look the other way. But if we have a compassionate heart at all, we know that we can't. With compassion, it is absolutely heartbreaking. And then you look at what's happening in the world around us and you compound that with personal tragedy. I mean, maybe it's a a struggle in your own life or a struggle in the life of someone that you know and love. Maybe it's a relationship issue or a health issue or a financial issue. And once again, you take it all in and we're overwhelmed, we're frustrated because we think to ourselves, I can't do anything about it, at least not anything of significance. And all of us, I mean, we want to help. We want to make a difference. And so what do we do? See, as followers of Jesus, we're called to do something, right? But when we look at all of these issues, all of these struggles in the world around us, there is no simple solution. And so what is our responsibility? As followers of Jesus, what are you and I called to do? St. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, beginning at the ninth verse, Let us not become weary in doing good. I mean, what a powerful statement. Let us not become weary in doing good. Weary is that don't lose your oomph. Don't lose your energy. Don't lose heart. Don't get tired of engaging. Don't become overwhelmed and simply disconnect and turn turn a, a blind eye. Paul says, do not let us become weary in what? In doing good. Now here, that word good, It's in the broad sense. He's talking about moral and ethical things as well as practical things. 
Don't become weary in helping those around you. Don't become weary in stepping up and attempting to make a difference. And Paul is saying, never give up. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. It's almost like Paul is saying, I understand your weariness. I understand the truth that you are frustrated and that you feel overwhelmed. I understand that you can get tired of caring, that you can get tired of carrying other people. But please, Paul is saying, don't get weary. Don't give up. Don't disengage. Because over time, at the right time, you're going to reap a harvest. You're going to reap a harvest. You're going to have an impact. And so never give up, even if you feel like you're losing the battle, even if you feel like you're not making a difference, that you're not making an impact. Paul is saying, do not give up. He goes on to say, therefore, as we have opportunity. Now, what I find interesting is that word opportunity in the Greek is kairos. Kairos is normally translated as time. And our time is limited, isn't it? So Paul says, therefore, as we have time, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. You get that? All people, regardless of culture, regardless of race, regardless of socioeconomic status. Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Just a little bit earlier, Paul wrote, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And what's the law of Christ? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul tells us in Romans 13 that love is fulfillment of the law. And so Paul is saying, my friends, don't quit. Don't throw your hands up and give up. Don't turn a, bl a blind eye, but make the most out of your time. Make the most out of every opportunity. As we have opportunity, as God opens those doors, make the most of it. Mother Teresa once said, life is a challenge. We must take it. And so here's my challenge for you this morning. You're ready for this? Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one ministry. Do for one youth group. Do for one single mom. Do for one child. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Now, I know what you're thinking. That flies in the face. I mean, directly in the face of what we were taught as a child. I mean, remember that? You'd raise your hand in class and you go to your teacher. Teacher, can I go to the bathroom? And the teacher would look at you and say, I'm not sure. Can you? Teacher, may I please go to the bathroom? And then, didn't you hate this response? If I have to let you go, go on, help me out, I have to let everyone go. If I let you go, I have to let everyone go. Or you'd go to your mom and say, hey mom, can I have an extra snack? And she'd say, Paul, if I give you one, I've got to give your sisters one. And even as a child, even as a kid, I was thinking to myself, no, you don't. You know, I, I'll tell you what, Ma, I won't tell anybody if you don't tell anybody. I mean, who made these rules up in the first place? I mean, it's, it's not even rational. My friends, just do for the one what you wish you could do for everyone. And see, the problem is this. As we grew up, as we began adulting, we took that rule into adulthood with us. And in our minds, oftentimes we think, well, if I can't help everyone, I won't help anyone. Because you know what? We want to make an impact, don't we? And we just don't want to make a low impact. We want to have a high impact. We want to be significant in the difference we make. But as Christians, we cannot crawl into a hole and hide Okay, we need to step up and do something. And so here is, here's the problem. Okay, we need to ask the question. Okay, if we want to have a solution, we need to ask the question, who is the one? In your life, who is that one? Who is that ministry? Who is that youth group? Who is that, that church? 
do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And I know some of you out there think, well, that's not fair. Well, my friends, life's not fair. Get over it, buttercup. You know, I'm hoping what takes place here is that God is nudging you right now. That you got this divine nudge, that you can see the one as you're challenged to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And no excuses. No excuses. And so this morning, I want to give you a couple of quick tips, okay, on how you can do for the one, right? Here it is. One, go deep. Go deep rather than just wide. Okay, it's easy for us to throw 10 bucks here, $10 there, to sporadically and spontaneously give, right? But I want to challenge you, instead of doing that, go deep. Pick the one, all right? What do you want to serve? What ministry? And commit to it. You go long-term and not just short-term. It's not just a quick hit, but focus on it. Give it some time. Give it some of your resources. Give it some of your energy. You see, we need to have a premeditated, designated, generous plan. You got that? We need to have a premeditated or a predetermined, designated, generous plan. I read a book years ago. It's David Bach, The Automatic Millionaire. And when you look at his advice on how to handle money, he basically boils it down like this. What can you do with money? Well, one, you can spend it. You can repay debt. You can pay your taxes. You can save it. And you can give it. And when you look at those five things that you can do with money, that's normally the exact order of the way that you and I spend money, right? We get our paycheck, we go out and we spend some of it. We repay our debt, normally the bare minimal that we have to pay. We pay our taxes. And if we have anything left over, well, then we'll save it. And then we may, we may give some of it away. Now, I want you to look at this. Spend it? That's me first. Repay debt? Creditors? That's second. That's still me, right? I'm paying off the debt I have accumulated. And then we give some to the government, and then we save it. Well, then that's me again. And then the very last one is others. Then we give it. I, I, that's shocking, isn't it? I know. I know. But if others are last, and I know this is going to hurt, this is going to sting a little bit, but if others are last, are we following Jesus? Because as followers of Jesus, you and I were called to put others first. In fact, St. Paul in Philippians chapter 2 says it like this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or in vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I mean, Jesus calls you and I to put others first because Jesus put us first. You know, he goes on to say, Jesus himself in Matthew 6 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You want to know what your priorities in life are? Take a look at your credit card statement. Where you put your resources is what you truly value in life. And so Jesus here is giving us some very practical uh, advice, practical application that you and I can put into practice today. You see, Jesus, man, he turned our world upside down, didn't he? The king came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so, my friends, you and I, we are called to serve. We are called to give. We are called to live generous. And when you live generous, I, I think we need to do two things. We need to live generous with a grateful heart and with a broken heart. We need to give generously with a grateful heart. So what are you thankful for? I mean, if you are thankful for the ministry of our Savior, for your local congregation, for the ministries that we are involved in, for the, for the ways that we serve and the ways that we live love as we strive to love Jesus, love people, and serve the world, well, then God calls you to support that ministry. I mean, I, I want to challenge you here too. Let's say you have a child or a grandchild who's off at college. And there is a college ministry going on. And your child or grandchild, they are actively involved in that ministry. And they're being ministered to. If you're thankful for that ministry, I want to challenge you. You should be helping support that ministry. What ministry are you thankful for? 
And so I think we give out of a grateful heart, but we also give out of a broken heart. In other words, when you look at the world around us, what stirs you? What's your passion? What drives you to to want to make a difference? And we help support those ministries as well. See, we give, and we give out of a grateful and a broken heart. You know, David Bach, now, I kind of adjusted this a little bit. The Automatic Millionaire, it's not a Christian book. He is a Wall Street guru who probably the only one ever getting rich off of it was him and the selling of his books. But he gave some really good advice. Okay, and like I said, I adjusted this a little bit, but he was like, you give first, then you save, and then you live off the rest. And you do it automatically because then it's painless. Do you ever notice when you automatically give, you never even recognize that it's gone. So you give first. You, you designate that ministry, right? It's a predetermined, premeditated giving. So you designate that ministry, you give first, then you save and you live off the rest. But my friends, I also want to challenge you not just to simply give your financial resources, but to give your time as well. Not just money. And you know what? Giving our time, that's difficult for us because you know what? Compared to the world, you and I, Man, we're kings. We're queens. I've shared this with you before. I've heard it said that if you have to decide what pair of shoes to put on in the morning, you're a king or a queen because much of the world doesn't have shoes. I mean, you and I, we are so wealthy that we have money sitting in the cup holder in our car. We've got so much money, it just sits idle in our car. Now, my friends, I don't want you to have FOMO. You know what FOMO is? It's the fear of missing out. I don't want you to miss out on being generous because generosity, when we live generous, it is a win-win situation. When you live generous, you're helping meet the need of someone else. You're making a difference in their life or in the life of a ministry. And when you do that, you win because you feel good. You feel satisfied, fulfilled. You have a purpose. You're making a difference. And And same thing with our time. When we use our time to minister, to make a difference with somebody, my friends, there is no more fulfilling thing to do. You know, I was trying to think of an example of this, an illustration from my own life. And the illustration I came up with years ago, when I was a pastor at St. John Lutheran Church in Ocala, Florida, there was a woman who was in her mid-90s. She lived at the Vinmar Motel on 441 in Bellevue, Florida. I'm not even really sure how I got connected with her. But I would go over her house for lunch once a week. And for months, I did this. We would sit together and we would talk. And then we started going through confirmation class. I used a seventh grade confirmation curriculum. And I went week by week with this this older woman. And I shared the gospel with her. We talked and I explained. She's my, my claim to fame. She is my oldest confirmand. I remember the last time I talked to her. After our time together and our lunch, which was normally like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we sat there and, and we prayed. And she said, Pastor, I just want to run. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, this is kind of ridiculous. I mean, you're 90 some odd years old. You're not going to be running. But we prayed. We prayed that she could run. It was the last time I saw her. And a few days later, when I preached her funeral sermon, you better believe it was all about running as she ran to the one who created her, the one who redeemed her, the one who called her home to that place that he prepared for her. My friends, who is the one in your life? Who is the one where God is calling you to make a difference? Paul writes, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and my friends, because of what Jesus has done, you and I are in Christ. We are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And all of this is from God. It's by grace. It's his undeserved love and mercy and favor that he showers down upon us. All of this is from God who reconciled us, who made us right, who restored our relationship to himself through Christ. You see, Jesus could and Jesus did for everyone. 
He did it for all of us. The old has gone. The new is here. And all of this is from God, who reconciled to us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. See, my friends, God has called you. God has given you a ministry. God calls us to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. I shared this illustration with you once before. There was a young boy walking down the beach. And this beach was just full of starfish. The tide had gone out and all of these starfish are on dry ground. This young boy is picking one starfish up after another and he's throwing it into the ocean. This older gentleman is also walking down the beach and he says to the young man, son, what are you doing? And the kid said, I'm throwing the starfish back into the water. The old man looked around and said, son, there are thousands of starfish on this beach. You cannot possibly make a difference. The kid picked up a starfish. He threw it in the water and said, I made a difference for that one. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. My friends, I want to challenge you today. Have a premeditated, a predetermined, designated, generous plan. And when you do, when you set it aside and say, this is what I'm going to give, I'm going to do it on a consistent basis, when you do, it's going to change your world. And it's not only going to change your world, it's going to change the world. It's going to change our community. It's going to make a difference for the kingdom. Hey, it was great to be with you this morning. You have a great day. God bless and live love.